Shall we start? Ah, okay, today is Friday, everybody's tired. Well, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah? So let us do something uh, short, right? So I'm going to uh, focus on doing maybe... Uh... Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to do something, simple things, right? But before, I mean, some people were interested. Actually, uh, yes. if for some reason you would be interested in, to go to Mexico to do MSc or PhD, you know, with me, just in Mexico, in Mexico mm -hmm. universities, yeah? So just drop me an email and I can guide you to the right place to ask information, yeah? The only issue, as far as I'm aware, maybe at, if you want to do MSc or PhD, either at UNAM or UAM, or any other university, I'm not sure, it's like you have to speak Spanish. So you have to, you have to, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know, but as far as I'm, I'm, uh, as far as I'm aware of, you, this is a requirement, but I'm not sure. So if you're, you would be interested to, you know, like for instance, there is a guy here who would like to go to do uh, medical physics, so I know the correct people there that you can ask, okay? Um, and I hope you understand my writing, that's my email. And, uh, and, yeah, and also I think that somebody sent me emails to ask me about things and maybe I didn't reply uh, because, send it again, because I, I got a lot of emails and it, I think it was buried somewhere. <laughs> yeah, send it again, please. Yeah. And in principle in Mexico so far, uh, there, is, there is good funding for students, either at MSc and PhD. Yeah. This is not, this so far, I don't think this is an issue. Yeah, and the salary uh, for living in Mexico, or the fellowship, it's not a salary, it's, it's quite okay, yeah? Okay, so what can we do today? So let, 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 let us do simple things, okay? <laughs> so, so I, I think it's very useful when you are doing derivations to do, when you do a very long derivation and you arrive to a horrible formula of we have done to do particular cases to see whether you, you recover non, non results. Yeah? So for instance, in a, there's a very, very well known result in random matrices, which is called related to spectral density, which is called the Wigner semicircular law that appears for the classical random matrix ensemble, JOE, JOE, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we are going to try to recover so we are going to do this particular case. Let's do recover Wigner's semicircle. So again, this law appears when you have a standard random matrices where the random matrix is, is filled with entries and then entries are, for instance, Gaussian random variables. But in our case, for the equations we derive, the matrices were not like this. Like, for instance, for Poissonian graphs, we were focusing on the spectral density of this adjacency matrix, which has a lot of zeros and a few ones, you know, a few ones per row and per colon. So remember, so we were doing, suppose that C is a connectivity or adjacency matrix. DVT matrix, and we will focus in Erdos in Erdos Reni graphs. So if you would go to a computer program or to a laptop and to ask him to generate one of these matrices, what would happen is like you have, you know, in a n times n matrix. You would have per row, per column, you know, a number of ones which is proportional to D, which is the average connectivity, right? And the rest is zeros. Like for instance, is if D would be three, then per row, per, co per column, on average you will have three ones and the rest is zeros. So this, this matrix is very, very sparse, right? Like for instance, suppose that this three, and you focus on this row I and column I, Right? And here you have, for instance, one here, zero, zero. Okay, one, and many zeros. So this is not dense. This is not a classical, uh, classical uh, the classical matrices, random matrices that appear in the classical ensembles. So how can we 
uh, from our equations get the Wigner semi-circular law is do, is do what is called the dense limit. The dense limit <coughs> is take d going to infinity. It's called the dense, what I call it, the dense limit. So now that the number of zeros per row or per column, you know, becomes bigger, bigger, and bigger. So you fill or you dense that, that row or column, yeah? And uh, what you would expect from our equations is that in the dense limit, you recover the Wigner semicircular law, okay? So far, so good? Okay, so how do we do the derivation? It's very simple. So we can do it with the replica method, with the equations we have for the replica method. And the equations that we have from, for the replica method. So let's start with the equations we have for the replica method. So what we have is the following. Like Tell me. Yeah. Yeah, for the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, the, you have random matrices where, where each one entry one is, a, is a Gaussian random variable with zero mean and variance one over n, n being the, or g, o, j, one parameter over n. Yeah? No, but when you do this, this, this dense limit, you, at least you, you are sure that you are going to have a number of elements in a given row or column field, in this case with ones, right? Uh, so you are trying to put, to get rid of as, as many zeros as possible. Yeah, but still there would be, the, it, it, so you know, the number you can, the way you can put the zeros and the ones, you know, is, uh, is random. And you have to be careful with how you do the dense limit because the idea, this is a very good, good question, okay? You do the dense limit after you do the thermodynamic limit. This is very important, right? So first you have to do the thermodynamic limit n going to infinity, and then you do the dense limit d going to infinity after the derivation we have done. And then this makes sense, right? right? So in such a way that the still d over n somehow still goes to zero, yeah? Tell me. Could you actually state uh, the, the law? Sure, the law is the, yeah, of course, I was going to, yeah. The law says that the following, I'm going to delete my email here. That if you have matrices, you know, A I J such that these entries are um, <coughs> Gaussian variables, okay, with zero mean, and let's say variance is J divided by N, right? Then the spectral density for this guy is equal to the square root of ba 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 four j square minus lambda square divided by four pi j I think something like this. So what you have is a semicircle, right? Or I think it's two j. We, we, we are going to derive it. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the diagonal, uh, it doesn't, doesn't affect that the, the, that the variance scales differently. So it is true that for the Gaussian orthogonal, some of you have to be a bit careful how you say how the scaling is for the diagonal and diagonal, but in the end, it doesn't impact this. Yeah, very good. More questions? Tell me. Yes. And not a number which can be combined between what you see and Yes. So to me, this looks like a completely different problem. Yes. We can have minus three in the big ensemble, and here we have just one or two. Yes, it is. And still, you got it, yes. Okay. Yeah. We don't have to do anything special. Yeah, this is a very good point. We don't have to do really anything, anything, anything special mathematically to take the limit. You'll see it's very easy. So it's just central limit theorem when you do the mathematical derivation. 
The only thing maybe you have to be a bit careful about, and even you don't need to do that, is to uh, change a bit the connectivity matrix. So it, so it is a weighted connectivity matrix that instead of having zeros and ones, you have when you have one, you have a value which is well scaled with D in such a way that when you make the D going to infinity, you have a sum which is finite. But e even this, you don't need it. Right? Shall we do the derivation? Yeah? No questions? Yeah. Okay, so let me, uh, let us remember what we have for the replica matrix, for the final equations, okay? So what we have is that the spectral density average over the ensemble of graphs was equal to the limit, it are going to zero plus of the integral of d omega, sorry, d delta omega of delta, the imaginary part of delta, okay? And we already discussed, and one divided by pi. And we already discussed the, the meaning of this notation. Where this omega of delta obeys the following self-consistent equation. It has the omega of delta is equal to the, uh, the sum k from zero to infinity, exponential of minus d, d to the k, divided by k factorial, the multiple integral for l from one to k, d delta l omega delta l, and this multiplies a direct delta of delta minus one divided by z, minus the sum for L from one to K delta L. Right? So far so good? Yeah, so the only thing I'm going to do is, okay, if instead of having a connectivity matrix or, con or a adjacency matrix, you have a weighted adjacency matrix, where now instead of having a, a one, you put a parameter which is j divided by square root of c. The only thing that this changes in that equation is, is, is here. I'll let you to do this thing as an exercise. You will have here uh, j, uh, j squared divided by c, sum for l from 1 to k delta l. Yeah, it's, it's simply at the scale that is in front of the variance. And the reason I'm putting this thing is because I want to have here one over C because I'm get, sorry, one over D. This is the average connectivity. One over D, because I want to take the limit D going to infinity. So I want to have a finite sum. But if you don't put it, it doesn't matter. The only thing that would happen is it, it tells you that the domain of the spectral density grows with D, like actually grows with the square root of C. Square root of D, sorry. Yeah? So you can, uh, you can do it both ways if you want. Good? Yeah, the matrix center. So it's still it's a, it's a weighted connectivity matrix where if two nodes are connected, you have a weight in this connection, which is j divided by square root of d. Okay. That's it. Yeah? And this, the only thing that it does is to change, uh, to rescale this factor. That if you notice, if I would to put it on the other side, it's like we're scaling c. Yeah, and c has lambda, and lambda is in, is in the, gives you the domain of the spectral density. By doing this work scale, I'm going to be sure that the, spect that the domain of the spectral density is going, to, is, is going to remain compact. It's not going to grow with D. But otherwise, if you don't need to do it, yeah? you will see. More questions? Okay, so how can I take the limit of D going to infinity in this expression? So what does it mean, D going to infinity? It means that, the, uh, that this the probability of a Poisson number to appear becomes larger and larger. Yeah? And this is going to impact the number of elements that you have in this sum. So in such a way that when D goes to infinity, you have an infinite number of, of elements in this sum. Right? And what is this? It's a sum of random variables. So the only thing you have to do is to find a way of determining the, uh, the probability of this sum of random variables. Okay. So how, you, how do we do this? Well, very simple. So I take this thing and I isolate it somewhere else with a beautiful Dirac delta. I'm all the time doing the same tricks. Man. <clears throat> I'm going to write this thing as follows. 
So I said that omega of delta is equal to an integral over something I'm going to call h, okay, of the sum of k from 0 to infinity of potential of minus d, d to the k, divided by k factorial of this multiple integral, l from 1 to k, d delta l omega of delta l, of the Dirac delta of delta minus 1 divided by z minus h. And then here I put multiplying a delta that tells you that h is equal to j squared divided by d, the sum l from 1 to k delta l. Yeah. I have done nothing. Good. Now forget about the rest of the universe. So let me uh, change a bit this, uh, this expression. This I can write now as follows. No? I can write this as the integral over dh, uh, delta, direct delta of delta minus 1 divided by c minus h. And then I have the sum of k from 0 to infinity of the exponential of minus d d to the k divided by k factorial. And then the product of l from 1 to k, d delta l omega delta l of this. And then I'm going to say a sentence that maybe is not the best way to express what I want to say. But I'm going to say it nevertheless, like uh, forget about the rest of the universe, right? <laughs> Tell me. Ah, yeah, of course, yes. So, well, so forget about the rest of the universe. We are not going, we are not doing random matrices. We are not doing spectral densities. So what is this object from a probabilistic point of view? What is this? It's a probability, uh, the, the PDF of H, no? So H is a sum of random variables. These random variables are independent because here you have the product of, of the PDFs, right? And I'm doing the average of the Dirac delta. So therefore, this is the, the density of the PDF of H. It's as simple as that. Do you agree with me? And then, you know, the relationship between H and these deltas is the sum. And this, uh, how you solve it? So this is a convolution of uh, uh, this. You can express this thing as a convolution of these uh, random variables, right? But these random variables are independent, so this is very easy to evaluate. You can apply that directly central limit theorem, or you can do directly the, the derivation. So let us do the derivation, right? So how do you do the derivation? You express, of, of as I always do, but now for a different reason. The Dirac delta using a Fourier representation. So this thing is equal to the following. So this thing, the whole thing, eh? this is equal to dh, dh hat to pi, exponential of i h hat eh, h of Dirac delta of capital delta minus 1 divided by z minus h. And then I have the sum of k from 0 to infinity, exponential of minus d d to the k, k factorial. And then I have what? Let us do it step by step. I have the multiple integral for uh, l from 1 to k, d delta l, omega delta l, of what? Okay. So I'm really, I've, I've really put the full representation of this Dirac delta. I've put one part here, and the other part would be the exponential of minus i h hat j squared divided by d sum l from 1 to k delta l. Are you with me? And since the variables are independent, this factorizes, right? So let us continue. So this is equal to the integral for dh, dh hat divided by 2 pi exponential of i h h hat of the Dirac delta of delta minus 1 divided by z minus h 
of the sum of k from one of sorry from zero to infinity of the exponential of minus d d to the k divided by k factorial and this is the same integral k times so this is the integral over d delta omega delta of the exponential of minus i h hat j squared divided by d delta to the power k. Yeah? So what I'm, what I'm doing is to prove central limit theorem. That's what I'm doing for a particular, for this combination of, for this sum of random variables. Yeah? So now I can do the, the series, right? Because I have this to the power k that I can put with this d divided by k factorial. This is exponential of this. So this is equal to what? This is equal to the integral dh, dh hat divided by 2 pi, exponential i h hat h of the direct delta of delta minus 1 divided by c minus h. And this, let's do it step by step, is equal to the series of k, the sum of k from 0 to infinity of exponential of minus d, 1 divided by k factorial, and then I have d, the integral of delta omega delta exponential of minus e h hat j squared divided by d delta to the power k. So this here, right, is the exponential of the thing which is within the, the square brackets. So, so let us continue. We sum the series, and this will give us what? This gives us that this is equal to the integral dh dh hat divided by 2 pi, exponential of i h hat h, Dirac delta of delta minus 1 divided by z minus h. And then I have what? Exponential of minus d, this d here, plus the exponential, well, inside the, the, the argument would, would be times the exponential of this, but I put this in the argument of the first exponential, plus d of the integral of d delta omega delta of the exponential of minus i h hat j squared divided by d delta. And you would say, yeah, I said you are, as usual, complicating things, right? But now I can do the limit properly when d goes to infinity. Yeah? Because after here d multiplying something that goes to, one, to zero when d goes to infinity. So I can do a Taylor expansion here and keep the, the leading contribution in D. Right? So now since when D goes to infinity, again, so let us do it. This would be equal to what? Integral dh, dh hat, divided by 2 pi, exponential of i h hat h, direct delta of delta minus 1 divided by c minus h, and then have the exponential of minus D, and then I have here plus D, and I have what? Let's do it like this. Let's do it last. I have the integral <coughs> d delta omega delta of one, one minus i h hat j squared divided by d delta plus terms that go like d to the minus two, to the minus two, right? Now, the integral of d omega, uh, sorry, d delta omega delta of 1 is 1 because these are densities. Then you have that the minus d cancels with this d. And what remains is the expectation value of this. And the d cancels with this d. And then overall you have terms which go like d to the minus 1. So this would be equal to what? The integral of dh, dh hat to pi, exponential of i h at h, Iraq delta of delta minus 1 divided by c minus h, and then I have here, what? 
exponential. Again, minus d cancels to the d. And then I have minus i h hat j squared. And then I have the expectation value of omega, of delta, no? That means the integral over delta, omega delta of delta, plus something that would go like d to the minus 1. Yeah? So far, so good? Excellent. So now, what on earth is the the integral of delta omega delta of delta, well, the expectation value of delta, no? With respect to this density omega. So notice that I have here the integral d delta omega delta of delta. Again, forget about the rest of the universe, yeah? What is this? The expectation value of delta, the first moment. So let us. Again, I want to confuse, I'm going to use the same letter that the note this thing as delta bar. Bar meaning which is the expectation value with respect to omega. Yeah? So then, what do I have here? I have here the expectation value of delta coupled to h hat. And I can put this thing back together. And I have what? So then, if I continue the derivation, this would be the integral dh hat dh divided by 2 pi, the Dirac delta of delta minus 1 divided by z minus h, and then I have exponential of what? Let's do it step by step. i h hat h minus, uh, blah, 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 minus i h hat j squared delta bar. Yeah? Good? So let me take, take common factor i h hat. So this is equal to this. But now I can integrate back h hat, and this is the direct delta of this, right? So a half, that is equal to the integral with respect to h of the direct delta of delta minus 1 divided by z minus h times the Dirac delta of h minus j squared delta bar. And now I integrate once, once more, and I obtain, surprise, surprise, something that is expected because I have the bloody sum of random variables and apply and a scale with 1 over d. If, you, if, you were, if it was a scale with 1 over square root of d, then you have to have a Gaussian distribution. You have a here a delta due to the scaling. Yeah? So it's a particular case of the central limit theorem. So then you integrate and you obtain that the following direct delta of delta minus 1 divided by c minus h, sorry, delta bar. Yeah? And now we go to, so remember where we came from, from the cell consistency equation of omega of delta. So what, what we obtain in this dense limit, yeah, what we obtain in this dense limit is that the omega of delta is the direct delta of delta minus 1 like this, right? So we obtain that omega of delta is equal to a direct delta of omega minus 1. Sorry, here I missed the j square, huh? Minus j squared. Sorry about that. Uh, Z minus j squared d uh, delta bar. But remember that delta bar was, by definition, the expectation value of delta with respect to omega. And that's it, no? Because this is very easy to, to continue. You say, well, what, what, what do I do with this? Well, I close the equation because the equation is a closure for the mean value of the, the spectral length the, of this parameter delta. So from here, I come here, and now on, from the left-hand side, I do this, this calculation, right? And what, what, what I obtain, right, is that the delta bar, which is by definition the expectation value with respect to omega of delta, 
would be I plug this thing into here. Let's do the final simple step. Uh, Dirac delta of delta minus one divided by z minus j squared delta bar of delta, this is equal to what? Well, this is equal to one divided by z minus j squared delta bar. So what I, I obtain is that this is equal to delta bar, which is a very simple quadratic equation for delta bar. And the spectral density, what it is, is, is delta bar, no? The imaginary part of delta bar. Because it's the first moment of uh, omega. Uh, so, so remember that the spectral density now in distance limit was equal to the limit eta going to zero plus of the imaginary part of the integral d delta omega of delta delta, but this is delta bar, no? So this is equal to the limit of eta going to zero plus of delta bar. Clear? Simple, no? Or not? Do you find the derivation simple? Notice that I'm always using the same the same stupid tricks, right? Dirac delta has to take things out, and so these tricks are very useful. Now, the only thing you have to do is, but this I will not do, no? Because I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure if I do this part, I will screw up, <laughs> right? Or <laughs> so just simply do this part. So all these things, so this is a quadratic equation, a polynomial equation of second order for delta, delta bar. You solve it, you have two, two solutions. There is a reason you have to choose one over the other. I'll let you to explore this reason. It has to do with how the spectral density has to behave when z goes to infinity, right? So that's how you choose one of the two solutions, and then you take the limit and you recover this Wigner semicircular law. Tell me. Wait, do we not need to take the imaginary part anymore? Yeah, yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, I'll put it here. Ah, because I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Thank you, yeah. It's the imaginary part of delta bar, yeah. Thanks. Questions? The, um, the, cho the choice between the two solutions uh, is uh, when uh, y when z uh, goes to infinity. Well, what is the reason? When d goes to infinity, because you go, to, you want to go to the from a diluted from an ensemble of diluted matrices, mm -hmm. sparse matrices, in the sense of three-like matrices, to matrices that, that, that are dense. So you are trying to approach this ensemble, ensemble as much as possible to an ensemble of random matrices where many of the ent entries are different from zero. Okay. Yeah? And these, uh, let us choose one of the two solutions of that equation. No, 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 this has nothing to do with this. This is always the case. Okay. Well, not always the case. Uh, so it's, fun, it's, it's funny. I mean, here you have a quadratic equation for delta delta bar. There are two solutions because you have two solutions. Okay. And normally, the way people choose the solution is to say, okay, I'm going to take the solution that gives me a density which is positively defined. Ah, okay. Yeah. But there is another way. I mean, you can do this thing a posteriori. But if you start, if you look, you go back to where we started in the this mapping. You can show that the solution you have to take is the one that behaves in a certain way when set in the complex plane, uh, when this, uh, when the spectral density for set, when set goes to infinity, behaves in a given way. Okay. It has to decay like one over set. And this will allow you to take one of the two solutions. Because one solution will not behave in this way when set goes to infinity, and the other one it does. So that's how you choose mathematically one of the two, one of the two signs. If not, do like everybody else does, right? It's like, I don't know which blood design to take. I know that this thing is, <laughs> this thing is, a, is a density, so therefore I cannot have the negative solution. Yeah? Very good. More questions? So, what else? What do you want me to do now? Do you want the, you, you, tell me. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then when like the magic is checking the limits over a good degree. Yeah. Of order one over D. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, but you don't have again. You don't have to take. Uh, you don't have to put one over d. So you can do the same the same analysis without doing this one over d. You simply have to be a bit careful how you take the the leading terms. Having one over d allows you to identify in a more visually in an easier way which are the leading terms. But it's not a big deal if you don't take one over d. More questions? Go ahead. Sure. Actually, this is funny. Okay. And, uh, actually, you, you wouldn't expect. Uh, actually, in some cases, and this is an open problem. So, in some cases, you start with an, an ensemble of diluted sparse matrices in the way we have discussed, like three like matrices if you, if you look at them visually. And then, in many cases, when you take the dense limit, you know, you recover classical results you know, for, full, for film matrices. But in other cases, you don't recover classical results, and nobody knows why. Well, a couple of guys know why, but it's not published yet, so you have to wait for a couple of months, right? But this is something I wanted to discuss in this lecture, but we are not going to discuss that. Okay? So the dense limit essentially always works, but in a few cases it doesn't, and you have to do something very special, much more complicated television to get to, to derive the classical results. Classical means in this case uh, film matrices, right? Classical ensembles. More questions. Yeah, for, 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 for matrices that belong to the classical, what I call classical ensembles, that would be the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, Gaussian unitary, symplectic, for the classical Richard ensemble, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah? For matrices where the entries, where the, the number, the, the essentially you don't have an, an, an extensive number of zeros in rows or columns, extensive with the size of the matrix. More this, questions? This, Tell me. Is, this is totally out of the scope. Yeah. Uh, because, for example, I've seen in these matrices the symbol of matrices of zero and one, and if one tries to create a thermodynamic limit, one would do like a Bernard Lavoisier on this, on the matrix. Okay, what, what do you mean by the normalization? Because uh, normalization is like a very, yeah, yeah, it's a very, it's a very powerful technique yeah. that appears in condensed matter, but to, in a certain particular context. Uh, like Well, it's kind of funny you mentioned this. Actually, central limit theory has to do with RG, but it's, yeah? but it's like a trivial RG. Because essentially, when you have a, in, in context matter, what you have is, is, is essentially you have, what is a Hamiltonian from a point of view of plurality? It's a, it's a bunch of random variables that are interacting, correlated. Yeah? And then what happens is that uh, depending on the parameters that appear and that weight somehow the correlations or the interaction between these random variables, when you want to, for some reason, derive from there like a macroscopic object, yeah, and you apply central limit theory, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. Like for instance, think about easy model and think about magnetization. What is magnetization? It's the sum of spins. What is that? It's the sum of random, bloody random variables, right? If these random variables are weak, weak, weakly correlated, then your central limit theorem applies. But when these random variables are strongly correlated, close to phase transitions, central limit uh, theorem doesn't apply. So RG, the normalization group, is a way to capture how this sum of random variables behaves. This is, this is RG, which is pretty cool. Yeah, but in this case, so when you say, yeah, this is RG, yeah, but it's, it's RG in the, in the, in the lamest, t uh, tamest, simplest possible way, which is weakly correlated. <laughs> No, I, I don't follow you. What is the question? Like, well, it was not a question. It was like an uh, intuition uh, that, I, that I ran through my mind. Like, we, we start with zeros and ones, and we arrive to this very general result for matrices that are not zeros and ones. Are yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean what, what we did now is something that you should always do when you do long derivation and has nothing to do with this exercise we did here. And it's something that is very good practice that after a long derivation, 
the worst thing you can do is to look at your division and to say, okay, I'm, I'm very cool, right? I'm pretty sure this is right, you know? It's better after a long derivation to see which particular cases or extreme cases you can, you can, you can do to see, to be sure that maybe your, your, your long derivation is correct or is likely to be correct. So what we are doing here is to do particular cases to see whether we recover known results. Yeah, but I, 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 yeah, but actually, bigness in particular law, you can prove that it actually is much more general. That uh, it applies to ensemble of matrices where the entries are independent or weakly correlated, but they don't, they don't have to come from a, from a from a Gaussian distribution. You only need to know the first two moments of the of the distribution of those random numbers. And the way to prove this thing, actually, you can prove it from here. Like for instance, now you can do this exercise as well. Okay. Suppose now that instead of weighting the elements that are different from zero with a constant, j divided by the square root of, of d, I weighted by another random number. So I have a, two nodes, i and j, and they are connected. That means c i j is one, but I put a weight which is random, right? And it's a Gaussian number. I put a weight which is j i j, okay, divided by square root of the square root of Again, this square root of this is that you identify easily what's going on when you take the dense limit, right? And now this comes from a general distribution, okay? So uh, these GIJs, they are generated by some distribution. What's your name? Camille. Eh? Camille. Camille. We are going to call the distribution C of J in honor of Camille, okay? Right? If you the whole derivation again, let me, let me write down again. The, <laughs> um, if you do the whole replica derivation again, you get a self-consistency equation, but now you have to take also into account the statistics of the j's. Yeah? So what, what you would have is the following. You would have that omega of delta is equal to the sum of k from zero to infinity of exponential of minus d, d to the k divided by k factorial. And now you have the k integrals, l from 1 to k of d delta l, omega delta l. But then you, now you have to take into account the distribution of the j's, which are the nodes which are connected. So then you have uh, d j l uh, c j l that multiplies to this beautiful direct delta of delta minus one divided by C minus, uh, I'm going to, that's right, that's right, I'll have one over T, the sum over L from one to K, J L, delta J L square, that's right, delta L. And if you want this in the limit, this limit this will resemble more, no? This will resemble more the, the classical ensembles, right? Because now you have in each entry, which is different from zero, you have a, if you want this can be Gaussian, now, now it's the Camillo distribution, right? But if this were the Gaussian distribution, this would be the diluted classical Gaussian this, uh, ensemble. And when D goes to infinity, I'm just recovering putting elements now from zero to different from zero. Now, can I, can I apply the same trick as before to do the dense limit? What do you think? Yes. Huh? Yes. Why yes? Yeah, I mean, the, the, this, these are, I mean, I mean, these are different distributions, but it still is the product of distribution. So therefore, the, this, which is a random variable, and this, which is a random variable, are independent, and then you have the sum of products of random variables, and you apply, again, the bloody central limit theorem. Yeah? So you do the same thing, and at the end, what you have when you do all the things we have done, you'll have that omega of delta is equal to Dirac delta after doing the dense limit of Delta minus one divided by z minus the expectation value of j square under Camillo's distribution, right? Times 
the expectation value of delta. That's why when you do the dense limit directly in the connectivity matrix, you get the same as the Wigner semicircular law because here you obtain directly the variance of that random variable. Yeah? And then you also realize that the Wigner semicircular law to recover it doesn't require that these numbers are drawn from a Gaussian distribution. They must be drawn from a distribution where uh, you know the first two moments or the first two cumulants are well defined because only, because only the second cumulant appears. Yeah? Here I'm assuming actually that the mean value of this, the yes is zero. Yeah? Not Cauchy. I think you, with Cauchy you have to be careful, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah? And this has been proven rigorously at some point by Terence Tau, <coughs> right? Assuming that you have an ensemble of random matrices and you know, and the, and the distribution is, has some kind of well-behaved properties up to the third moment. Okay, so depending on the distribution, you always get weakness and circular law. Distribution for the matrix entries. I, this is not a rigorous proof, by the way. Okay? This is just... Approved on my fetishes. <laughs> More questions? Eh? It is, it is, it is. So it is, it is already, okay, when I say, I say yeah, yeah, I'm all, um, uh, yeah, I'm all focusing in this step of derivation that from the beginning I say that the connectivity matrix is symmetric, okay? See, if, if I is connected to J, J is connected to I, and of course the weight of both of them is the same. So in some part when I do the derivation, I will symmetrize and I would focus on those elements which are independent from the rest because the, the rest are, are fixed by symmetry. So here, again, so J yeah, yeah has to be equal to J, yeah, J, yeah, I, but, you know, I and J yeah have to be connected. If the matrix is the, if the, you can have, I, I was planning to do this thing on Monday, yeah, and I will stop, stop tortu, torturing you, right? Monday we are going to, to do non-Hermitian matrices, which, funnily enough, to solve, to, to do these tricks, you only, you only need to know about electrostatics a bit. You will see why. More questions? You want to do, you want to the, uh, hear about the Vichart ensemble? Yeah? You're make me work very hard, eh? Okay, let's work, uh, let's talk about the Vichart ensemble. So this is cool for students because the, when you do a Vichart ensemble, you have to learn, so you have to realize something when you do the average over the matrix entries. We are going to do the diluted Vichart ensemble, which is very cool. And again, actually, this derivation, you can do it with the cavity method, and the cavity method is nicer because when you apply the dense limit, you have to, take, you have to think carefully what is called on Sager reaction term. And you have to realize that that term is zero. But I'll let you to think about that. Huh? On, on salary reaction, the know cavity equations and tap equations, relationship about cavity equations and tap equations, you know, in here, when you go from the cavity equations to the tap equations, the on salary reaction term is zero. I only know tap integral. Huh? I only know tap integral. Tap, tap equations is from uh, Thaules, Almeida, Palmer which was the reaction of the replica method because nobody, nobody understood replica method. And it was just a way to, it was a way to write down microscopic equations for local magnetizations in spin glasses. Have you heard about these tab equations? Okay, now that, that, this, would be, this is for a different spring college, I think. Huh? Well, we're going to be here one more week. So if you want, I can, we, I can show you about this tab equations. But let's focus on <laughs> random matrices. Okay, let's discuss about uh, the Bichard ensemble. But we are doing uh, the, the diluted Bichard ensemble. Diluted. <laughs> so 
So what is the Bichard ensemble? Okay. Well, the definition is not going to be the diluted case. The Bichard ensemble is the following. Suppose that I take a rectangular matrix. Um, I have a matrix G, uh, G uh, well, with entries I mu, I from 1 to N, mu from 1 to P, right? For the moment, there, there is no randomness. This is just a matrix, okay? Which is a rectangular matrix. It's a matrix of size N times P. And then, given this matrix, I define another one. W, which is simply, let me do this thing properly, uh, G times G uh, transpose, right? So that means that this, I'm doing this thing correctly, uh, yes, so this is an N times N matrix, where the matrix entries W of ij is equal to the sum of mu from 1 to p of g i mu, j, a g, j mu. Right? So, what's a wood? And this ensemble was introduced by Bichard in 1924 to represent, uh, you know, matrices which are uh, covariance, covariance matrices. Yeah. Good. Are you with me? Now, suppose I'm going to do, uh, and again, this matrix, they can be whatever they want. This is a general definition. This is simply a product of rectangular matrices, right? So let's just put uh, into a nice, nice, nice context of a graph, bipartite graph, something like that. So suppose that now this J, uh, this matrix J, sorry, uh, G, I mu, represents the weights of links on a bipartite graph. So what is a bipartite graph? It's a graph where you have two family, family of nodes. Why well, in this case, I think that I have bipartite, that's okay, yeah? Why do you think I have two family of nodes? Because I have two different type of uh, indices, one that goes from one to n, and the other one that goes from one to p. Okay, so let us represent the nodes of a bipartite, these two family of nodes in a bipartite graph with circles. So I will have i from one to n circles, and then I have squares. Mu from 1 to P, right? And then this matrix is telling you, okay, if the element I mu of this matrix is, is different from zero, yeah, then the circle I is connected with a square with a square mu. And the weight is precisely G I mu, right? So then I have a bunch of, you know, squares connected to circles. And the circles are connected to other squares. Etc. Et I suppose that this is not mu, and this is not i. So if the, there is a link between these two guys, it's because g i mu is different from, from zero, and then mu can be connected to, sorry, note i can be connected to a square nu. This would be the entry g i nu, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah? So far, so good. And again, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm drawing a tree because I want to make the things simple. This doesn't does have to be a tree. Unless, of course, I apply, apply here the cavity method. Well, suppose that actually uh, we have that uh, a viper that graph has a weight that is given by a diluted matrix. Yay. All right. And the next question is, OK, how W looks like? given the, 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 this uh, bipartite graph, okay? So remember that W is J, J transpose, sorry, G, G transpose, that means W, I, J is equal to the sum mu from one to P of J, G, I, mu, G, J, mu. All right? 
Claro. Sorry, I might not familiarize by the term of the partite graph is a graph that uh, you know can be partitioned into two different two different fa families of nodes. Two families of nodes or more? Yeah. One family, other family, okay. and the graph is you see, the graph is divided into nodes, square nodes which are connected to to circles, yeah. but not squares and vice versa. Um, yeah. Ah, this uh, yeah, this is wrong. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that was the problem. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if I give you a graph of this sort, yeah, which is tree-like, for this weight for the bipartite graph, uh, what is the how this the graph associated to W looks like? Do you have an idea? So that's right. So what is going to happen is like a, so you're tracing away the squares, but keeping track uh, how the now the circles are going are going to connect it by the squares, and what you get are clicks. Like for instance, if these nodes are connected by this square, what it results is all these nodes are connected by this link, and then you have connections between all these nodes. So then you get something, but it's not going to represent this thing. Okay, you have to do it because. All to all, I think so, yeah? Um, yeah, that's right, because what happens, like for instance, this, if, if I take this one, ij, yeah? And I sum over mu, these two are connected by mu. So these two, this, this is connected, and this is connected, and this is connected, and this is connected. It's just the sum of the links of the yeah. of the links. Yeah, the and the weight would be the corresponding one, okay? If the, the matrix entries are just zeros and ones, so you, what, what, you would, what you get is simply the connection with weight one. So this one will result in something like this, no? For the central thing. So you have these four nodes, <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, which are connected, no? Something like this, I think, right? And then maybe this would be connected to uh, another click. And maybe this would connect it to a click of, I don't know, five, whatever, with all the possible links, etc., etc. yeah? Good. Well, now suppose that your boss, your f future boss, and your current boss comes to you and says, "Okay, I want to for you to derive the spectral density of these weird objects. Why not?" No, and then you just scratch your head and you're like, "What on earth? I'm, how on earth I'm going to do this? Shall we do it?" I'm going to give you the okay. So I'm not going to do the whole thing because I'm a bit tired. Tell me. No, no, yeah, yeah, so what I'm doing now is like from this graph, which is represented by a matrix, okay, I know that W will have an associated graph because, you know, it's related to the J's with this product, you know, so giving this picture, what is the corresponding picture of W if I understand that this is like a weighted connectivity matrix for, the, for, a, for a new graph? Huh? Ah, a click is just a connection of nodes on a graph which are connected with, uh, all, all with all between themselves. This is a click. So like a, the triangle there is a click. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And sorry, No, and, and there is in the, so le, le, let us do it in the, the simplest possible case. Le, let us assume that the, that the weights are zeros or ones. Zeros, the node i mu are not connected, one is connected, yeah? So now, I give you this, this tree for the bipar, bipartite graph, and I, I want to construct the tree corresponding to W, right? So then, uh, you know, this, 
I need, I need to check if i and j are connected, because if they are not connected, I will not draw a line. Is that okay? So let us say that, uh, okay. I suppose that this is i and this is j, right? They are connected by a mu. So when I sum over mu, there is a point from 1 to n, there is a point that this label will take precisely this value. And you will have 1 times 1, because these two, two links are, are, are there. Yeah? So that means that the corresponding weight for Wij is 1. So that means that in i and j, you have to put a link. Yeah? If this i and j. So I take now k. Yeah? And I go to the matrix entry, W, I, K. So what happens, like here I do the sum for mu, and at some point mu is going to be the mu that is connecting I and K. So that means I have to draw a, a link now for the weight associated with W that goes from I to K, etc., etc. So what happens, like when you sum over these mu's that appear in this product of G with J, D, J transpose, what you do is to link all the nodes that are connected by uh, this uh, square node. Better? No problem. Sorry, I'm tired already. No, it's Friday. Yeah, so now you have a crazy boss, a Spanish crazy boss, and it tells you, okay, I want you to calculate the spectral density of this, right? And then you say, I don't know how to do this. So what you would do? You start psychotherapy or? No, so the so first thing to realize is like, okay, so the first thing to realize is like, uh, well, um, the mapping, first is, go ahead. No, the spectral density is the spectral density. Yes, so that means this, this is a matrix, yes. W. I can calculate the spectrum, or suppose that God gives you the spectrum. I want the spectral density of this. But in this case, the spectral density would tell me a distribution of the size of the clicks. It would, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the clicks will impact the shape of the, of, the, of the spectral density in the same way that for uh, Derdos, Erdos Reni graphs, you know, certain topology of the graph impacted, you know, the discrete part of the spectrum. But, I, but in this case, it's not, it's, gonna, it's not going to be so easy to disentangle, yeah? Okay. But yeah, you can get some information about the topology. Thank you. More questions? Very good. So, so what you do is to do this mapping, no? So you say, okay, so what do I know? What I know is like the empirical spectral density for this matrix W is equal to, well, the limit going to eta to zero plus of uh, minus two divided by pi divided by n, the imaginary part of the derivative with respect to set of the logarithm of the partition function for this matrix W of set, for set is equal to lambda minus i eta. So why can I, I can do this directly? Why can I do this thing directly? Because the, the mapping was exact for any, any symmetric matrix, and this is a symmetric matrix. That's it, right? And then once I'm here and I map the, my problem into a problem in, in stack make, I have to, there are two ways to solve it, no? At least the, one, the ones I show you. Cavity method or replica method. Now, both are very cool, yeah? And we are, well, I'm, I'm going to give you the ideas. And, uh, and actually this in, the first paper I published, on, I published in this area, right? And um, now, and in this case, they, they have some sub subtleties, right? So for instance, in the cavity method, it's better, you could apply, you can apply the cavity method directly to this graph, but this is annoying, because you have to be sure what you have to remove to the decode like things. Remember that the trick of the cavity method is to find Something in the system you have to remove that there, such that the rest of the system becomes statistically, statistically independent. That's the trick. So for the cavity method, it's better, again, you can, do, you can do it directly in this type of graphs. Click. These are like click tree-like graphs, right? 
But it's better to do it in the bipartite graph for the graph of uh, the G. So you can write a Hamiltonian in this mapping where you have, you know, explicitly two type of thermal variables, one type of thermal variable associated to the squares, and the other type of thermal variable associated to the circles. Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how can you see this? Well, do the mapping. Again, remember that this mapping is, the mapping is always the same, right? So the mapping is this at a Hamiltonian that was equal to one. Let's, let's put it like this. It was one half of the sum of ij from 1 to n of xi z minus wij xj, where wij is given by this. From this, uh, if combining this with the definition of the, this Wishart ensemble, uh, you can show that this, well, you can rewrite this Hamiltonian as if it has two uh, variables, one sitting on these uh, square nodes and another one sitting in these circle nodes. Right? And then what you do, you apply cavity method to, twice. You see what happens in this graph when you remove a circle node and then you see what happens when you remove a square from the graph. And then you have two type of cavity marginals, ones for the variables which are in the squares, and the other ones for variables which are, which are in the circle. So you have now two couple equations for do these two distributions, and then you can apply cavity, uh, you, can, uh, you can show that actually the marginals uh, can be, are actually Gaussians, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do the same trick, okay? Cool, so I'll let, you, I'll let you do it as an exercise. It's, in a, it's an article I published in uh, some time ago, in 2008, it was appearing. Yes? Well, another, another way to do it is by replica method. So let me just give you, do, let's start doing the derivation for the replica method and stop in the crucial step that you have to realize that you have to be, a, you have to do, a, you have to be a bit careful how you proceed. So suppose that I want to do replica method. So in this case, in this case, I'm worried about the expectation value of the empirical spectral density, which co corresponds to doing the expectation value of the logarithm, blah, blah, right? And this would be equivalent. And then I apply here the replica trick, and it means to do the expectation value of the nth power of the partition function. And at some point, this would be equal to this, right? So I have the same old, same old. The integrals for the replicas alpha from 1 to n of dn x i vector alpha of 1 of the exponential of minus z divided by 2, sum i from 1 to m, sum alpha from 1 to small n, x i alpha square, and then a half, I'm going to delete this part. And then a half, the expectation value. This would be the expectation with respect to some randomness of this graph. G, the expectation value of this, of, um, uh, give me a second, yeah sum for all i and j, sum over alpha from 1 to a small n of w i i uh, j x i alpha x j alpha. Okay. Now, now you would be tempted to do the following thing, yeah? And this would be wrong. Right? I still am not giving you the distribution, the type of distribution that you have for this double use, but suppose that this would be the, the connectivity matrix we, we saw in uh, Erdos Rangi graph, right? What you would do is to say, ah, well, so I can symmetrize this sum, I can focus in the terms which are independent, and then I can factorize, I can put this sum here as a product, and then I can I worry about only to do the expectation values with respect to the, the double use. Yeah? 
So you would be tempted to do the following. So this is equal to the something like this. The here there would be one half. Okay, I'm missing some terms, but that's not the point now. So I have I'll write something like i is more than j, some alpha from one to n, w i j, x i alpha, x j alpha, expectation value. Okay, so the so last focus on the term, which I think is important to understand that you have to be careful, careful, careful in this case. And you, and you think now, this is equal to what? This is equal to the expectation value of the product of phi smaller than j of the exponential of the sum over alpha from 1 to n of w i j <coughs> of x i alpha x j alpha. And then you would think that this is equal and you would think that this is equal to the product of phi smaller than j of the expectation value of the exponential of w i j the sum over alpha from one to a small n of x i alpha x j alpha, right? As we have done before, we did this trick. And this, uh, what this thing is reflecting, it was reflecting before, is that these random variables are independent, independent and identically distributed. So that, that, that means that the expectation of the product is the product of expectations. But in this case, this is clearly wrong, no? Well, why? Because W i j is by definition the sum over mu of j i mu g, g i mu g j mu, <laughs> right? And if I uh, suppose that now that the matrix entries of G, they are independent, okay? With this expression, that means automatically that the matrix entries of W are correlated, right? So that means you cannot factorize this. Well, this is wrong. Cool? And then you, you, get, you become desperate, and then you start crying, or saying, how am I going to do this? Because otherwise my boss is going to fire me, or not. But this is a very simple way to solve this, no? With uh, using Dirac deltas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dirac, the, the, you know, it was, uh, he did very cool things, but Dirac, the Dirac delta is, is, is pretty good trick, right? Yeah, why? How you, how you use, tell me. Here, uh, here. No, no. So this is uh, this was the product. So this uh, this is an equality. So this the, the you know the expectation value of the n power of the partition function is equal to the whole thing. So this was time. And from here, I was only focusing in the in certain part of the terms that appear in the derivation because I want to emphasize that you have to be very careful with this. And the solution of this, I mean, there, there are various ways to do it. Okay, but the, another way to do it is to again use a direct delta. So why? Well, so let's think about it. You see, if I go back to this expression, let's go back to this expression. I have one half of the sum of ij from 1 to n of the sum of alpha from 1 to small n. And let, let me put the definition of wij, which is sum of mu from 1 to p of j i mu o sea, g i mu, g j mu of x i alpha, x j alpha, right? And then I notice that I can reorder this to write the following. I can write this as one half of the sum of mu from one to p of the sum over alpha from one to a small n. And you notice now if I do since it's a complete sum for i and j, I can put this thing as the sum of i from 1 to n of g i mu x i alpha, and the same for the other one. And I have a square, no? I have the sum over i from 1 to n of g 
gi mu x i alpha s square. And the only thing I have to do now is to linearize this. If I linearize this, then I can factorize. So there are two ways to linearize this by Howard Stratonovich transformation on the introduction of Dirac delta. So you introduce a Dirac delta, you isolate this, and now these terms that appear here are statistically independent, and then you can do the, the average correctly. Yeah, so again, Dirac, Dirac delta to the rescue, or Howard and Stratonovich to the rescue. It's over, it's, no, it's, it's over G. So, so the way to, okay, maybe I, I, didn't, define, I didn't find it properly from, from the beginning. So, so you assume that the matrix Gs are random, and therefore the whole G is random. Uh, for simplicity, you assume that the matrix entries of G are, are independent from each other, but that doesn't mean that these are, these are independent, they are correlated. But when you do the expectation value, it's the expectation value over the statistics of the Gs, yeah? Questions? And again, you know, yeah, we, 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 uh, we saved the day and the, the boss would be happy. What's up? So the main uh, thing that we get after applying the Bricard is a nice expression for the density, but I can only do it when the distribution that I'm working with is kind of like too easy to, to write down as a Bricard right? Like if I take It depends on the constraint. Okay. This is not true. So if because if, if you have a global constraint, the global constraint can be expressed as a direct delta. Okay. <laughs> and therefore, you can do a derivation as well. If the constraint is a, is a local constraint, maybe you can put a soft, a soft, like a Lagrange multiplier, and still you can do some type of approximation to derivation. So, so still there are many things you can do. But the, the, the trick is always based on this kind of factorization, right? So this one here. More questions? So I'll let you do the, 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 the derivations of this, no? For, uh, for, uh, for dinner. <laughs> what else? So we have one more day. So what do you want me to do for Monday? You want, let us do the non-emission non case. Yeah? So for non-emission matrices, and the trick for the, to solve these problems, well, there are many tricks. No, actually, you, you need an extra trick which co comes from ele electrostatics, okay? So I need you to remember yourself the following. What is the, if I understand the Laplacian in two dimensions, you know, the, the derivative with respect to x squared plus the derivative, huh? what is the inverse of this operator? So what you have to put here, such this is a Dirac delta. Again, Dirac delta, right? It appears that I'm, I'm obsessed with Dirac deltas, yeah? And this is related to electrostatic problem in 2D. If you know what this thing is, then you can apply this thing to solve problems of non-emission matrices. You, I mean, you know, in, in 3D, you know that the inverse of this is 1 divided by, no? Yeah? But this is only in 3D. You know, in a two-dimensional world, the, the electrostatic potential has a, has a different shape. You know what this shape is, no? The, that's right, the logarithm. Right? And, uh, what, what, and we love logarithms. No? Because logarithms of eigenvalues can be related to logarithms of determinants of matrices. Yeah. Very good. That's it? Coffee? Or tea? Very good, thank you. <laughs>